let's thank you let's uh, quickly go through some uh, housekeeping before we uh, dive into everything so um this will be a live environment session which also means things might go wrong um so just uh, that you're aware of that it will be recorded as you just heard um, so you can review it later um i'd invite everybody to use the zoom chat um if you have questions you can ask there please um just start right now using the zoom chat and uh, just quickly share your role at uh, kriya and your expectations to the today's session um if you ask questions in the chat um i have two colleagues of mine um claire and mom um, in the call as well two other solution architects um which uh, can pick up those questions and answer them otherwise sometimes i might just pick it up live and uh, then we can discuss directly in the session with that um let me whoop let me just uh, quickly introduce myself my name is jan i'm a senior solution architect at gitlab i joined the company um like two years ago um having worked as a gitlab customer in the devops space um, for quite some time before and then at some point uh, it felt natural to uh, switch the role and uh, work for the company and i product i enjoyed so much and love so much um so as as i said i would just uh, start with um, using the chat here solutions architect um i will conduct this session today so as i said please use the chat quickly uh share your role and your expectations um now with all further ado let's have a brief look at uh, today's agenda um, I will first, of course, give you an overview over GitLab and uh, the live project we'll be using today. Um, we'll cover a lot of topics in the day-to-day -day life of a developer um, who is using the GitLab DevSecOps platform. So we'll use the JIRA integration um, because that's what we discussed uh, before. So you're using JIRA for planning. Um, we will go through... Um, the whole source code management process, merge request code reviews, um, including, of course, the automation with um, GitLab CI. We will um, touch the topic of uh, the security scannings um, and the tools and the workflow GitLab provides um, here. And um, there was one special request, um, which I kind of incorporated um, and which uh, Obviously, uh, Ciaran, please correct me if I pronounced your name wrong, uh, is quite interested in it's the topic of feature flex. So this will be the live implementation we are doing today. And if there is time, we might also briefly discuss the topic of how to migrate from Azure DevOps, uh, although I have the feeling that um, this will probably fall off. So, um, as said, GitLab is a DevSecOps platform, which means we are one platform that covers the full software development lifecycle um, in that frequently used um, infinity symbol loop um, that would be planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, deploying, operating, and monitoring. And because security becomes more and more important, everything is covered with um, with uh, the security um, on top. Um, with that being said, let's hop into today's project. Um, this is a .NET project. Um, um, it's astonishingly uh, simple. Um, I have to say, it's basically just a small web server that returns uh, hello.net on the um, on the on the web route. I picked a very simple example. Um, also, my .net uh, 
uh, that foo is not very, uh, very good. Um, so I try to keep it uh, simple also for the sake of myself, not um, uh, tripping into some issues which I would not be able to resolve. Um, as you see uh, in GitLab, we have kind of this um, hierarchy in which you put your, your projects. Um, every project has a repository. Projects are in groups. Groups can be nested. Um, on GitLab.com, you will have like a top level group, which is kind of your, your organization namespace. And within that namespace, you can create subgroups um, like here, what I call the full lifecycle. It's for my full lifecycle demos, obviously. And um, within that, I will have uh, specific projects. I might have also subgroups. So you can nest um, uh, a bunch of subgroups into each other. Navigation also kind of follows um, this uh, software development lifecycle. So we have the plan, um, code, build, um, secure, deploy, operate, and monitor topics. And then, of course, on top, like analyze and, and manage. Um, yeah, so that is basically the the fundamental uh, the fundamental setup. Um, of course, if you're familiar with um, other tools, um, or if you're already a little bit familiar with with GitLab, I think you will um, find yourself um, around easily. Um, that is, uh, you can look at at the code history. So basically, doing the uh, the git the git lock um, uh, to review the comments we have branching uh, you can create tags I think that's um, pretty much like um, every tool to um, to work in the software development lifecycle we have um, CIs which come in the form of um, of pipelines we'll dive into that um, later I'll just give you like a little a little idea how that how that looks like um, in uh, GitLab. The uh, CI uh, automation is um, arranged in stages, um, which means we'll have like a build stage, a test stage, a deploy stage. You can have as many stages in your CI as you want. And then within each stage, you have jobs, which um, all jobs in a single stage run in parallel. All stages run one after another. And these are kind of like the typical um, way you would do it. You will have a build stage, will have a test stage where you would execute your um, own tests, unit tests, integration tests, but also the security scanning, which we'll cover later in the session. And then at some point you will deploy into a staging, into a production. Um, here I just, for the sake of simplicity, deploy into a production environment. Um, everything we do in um these steps will also leverage GitLab features. So the build will end up in uh, the container registry, which um, which we provide. Um, so basically the main build, that's how I configured it here. The main build will end up um, in this um, main image here. So you have some different um, releases which are kind of identified by their commit char. Of course, you can give them uh, a dedicated tag, like the latest tag, which is, of course, quite common. And also the fact that I deployed it, I deployed it into my Kubernetes cluster. I configured it that way that um, it will be deployed into my Kubernetes cluster, which means um, I can also track this deployment into what we call environments. Um, so I have defined a production environment it's really just catching the CI job, which then actually does the deployment. Um, so I can see, okay, this was deployed um, like uh, today, very early in the morning. Um, the last time triggered by me, um, I can directly open this live environment, and look at it. So that is basically the... Um, hello.net uh, response you would expect from this uh, service as I showed it to you before. And um, you can create as many environments as you want. I mean, production is an obvious one. Staging might be um, an obvious one. It's important to say that these environments are really just 
markers, of course, your or your CI steps are responsible for setting it up. It's just that the CI job marks that this is basically a, this job is basically a deployment into a production environment or in an environment called production. So it's merely just a marker to keep track that a CI job actually did a deployment into something. So that is um, kind of the, the project we are dealing with today. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to um, put them in the chat. But I guess it's, um, or at least I hope, it's all quite self-explanatory so far. So let's hop to the first um, to the first point of the agenda. We will look at the Jira integration. I've configured um, the Jira integration, which you can do here in the settings. Um, you can do that on um, project level. You can also do that on group level. I have configured it um, on project level. I have here like a Jira project, which um, is um, identified as, um, as HiDot. And um, our task today, which will follow, is um, to create a simple feature flag. This is what we're going to do. Um, on GitLab's side, we can see the issues from Jira through the integration. Um, oh, there's obviously the icon not rendered properly. Apologies for that. But um, I can just um, have a look at the issue as it is in Jira. So you'll see it reflects basically what's um, written here in the Jira description. So I can, of course, also um, see that in GitLab. I can also auto close an issue in Jira, if I want that by doing a commit message, just basically closes I.1, that would close the issue. Um, so that's the connection from Jira into GitLab. And of course, we also have the connection reverse. Um, we would um, be able to create branches and commits um, from Jira in GitLab. So I would suggest that's. Uh, Let's simply do that. Um, I will have to pick a project here because I did not really connect it. Um, let me just briefly search for the right one. Hello.net should be the one. And we branch off from main. We use the default proposal for the branch name. I think that's reasonable. And let's just uh, let's just create the branch. So once we have done that, um, I think it will also, um, or it's supposed to leave, let me just reload that, it's supposed to leave a comment um, that this has happened. Yeah, so um, it, uh, no, it didn't. Maybe I did not configure it to leave a comment, but usually, actions um, on GitLab, you can configure it that it leaves a comment in the history of the um, associated issue. Um, so maybe I did not configure that properly, apologies for that. But here we will now have um, our branch available. And um, we can basically take it on from there. What we at GitLab advise um, is to create a merge request immediately when you open the branch. That is because we think it's a good place to collaborate over the code changes you're going to do. And it's also where all the, all the various information um, from the code changes come together. So we will create a merge request from the very beginning. I mark it as draft. So it's not accidentally merged. I have the description here that it will close um, the high dot one issue. I will assign it to myself. I could give it some labels. I could add it to a milestone if I want already is so a milestone um, definition that something needs to be ready at a certain time. And then of course we delete the source branch. Well, I will keep the source branch um, when it's merged. So. Let's go ahead 
and uh, do a merge request. So right now, the branch doesn't contain any changes um, because, well, we didn't, uh, we didn't do anything reasonable. I will just jump into my IDE for that. Let me do a git pull just to update. And then let's just check out the um, branch, which doesn't have a commit so far. And let's begin working on that. So we want to apply some feature flags. So that's our, um, our current task which means feature flags in GitLab are implemented using the Unleash library. Um, you are able to basically define feature flags for your application, for your service. Here in the feature flag section, I will just um, create one, um, which I will just call hello. Customer, so um, if active, change the response from hello.net to hello customer. Here we go. Strategy will be that if it's um, if it's enabled, it will be enabled for all users. You can, of course, also do um, a percentage of rollouts. Um, then on the client side, on the service side, you have, of course, to add a marker, like a session ID or something like this. You can also make it dependent on user IDs, um, which then, of course, means that in the implementation, you have to provide Unleash um, with the ID of the current user, so it can make this decision. In this case, now we will say it will be um, for all users if it's enabled. We will also do that for all environments, just for the sake of simplicity. And um, for now, I will disable the feature flag. So you can enable and disable it here. But then, of course, if you use um, the extended uh, strategies, um, you would be able to say like a percentage of user, and you would have to be able to roll up this um, percentage of users um, or percentage of um, sessions um, to get more and more users um, on that particular feature. As I said, we'll keep this for all users. I have disabled it for now. Let's get back to coding. So I will take um, this uh, simple um, C sharp file here. We have to add uh, two packages. So one will be um, the Unleash client, which we will need for that. And the second one will be a JSON library because the data is um, put back and forth as JSON. I think the Unleash client would allow you to inject whatever JSON library you want. By default, it just uses this Newton's of JSON library. Um, so we'll just go with that one. And then, of course, let's write a log file because I think that's good practice. Um, so what we need to do is um, in the code, let's just do use unleash um let's use um, the unleash uh, client factory um and uh, then i think I just for the sake of simplicity i will just copy and paste this block um I'm not writing it out so what's um what's happening here we install and initiate the unleash settings um, we can define application name, we can define an environment. As you know, the feature flex, I showed that previously, you can set it per environment. We just now assume this is production environment just to make it a little bit simpler. And then we need two um, key information which we can retrieve from the GitLab UI. Here in the configure tab, 
that would be the API URL, which we just use here, and uh, the instance ID. So we hard code them here in a regular environment. You would probably just um, inject them with uh, configuration or environment variables. And then um, the Unleash library caches the information it retrieves from GitLab. And so it's, I think usually the cache is like uh, refreshed every 60 seconds, which is suitable for most use cases. But here I would just put it down to 10 seconds. Um, so we have a faster reaction when you change the, um, uh, the feature flag. Okay, and then of course we initiate um, the the Unleash um, client in the end, and um, now we have to replace our um, controller here for the um, for the root route with a query to the Unleash library. Is that feature flag actually enabled? And then if it's enabled we will return hello customer. Otherwise we will return what we returned so far, the hello.net. So um, that should be it. I would just uh, commit. I'm a command line guy, so I will do that on, on the command line. Just uh, briefly add everything and uh, let's give it a comment and let's push it back to GitLab. So that is the change. I uh, hope it's it's pretty straightforward. Also, um, the way we are using um, these feature flags. Um, I think those people who wanted to know more about uh, Chiaran, again, sorry if I uh, butchered your, your name. Um, if if you think that explains it uh, well enough so far, um, or if you have further questions, just ask in the chat. So let's get back into the GitLab platform. We have uh, set up everything, so we will have our um, our merge request, and of course, yep, yeah, good. Thanks for confirmation. Um, of course, um, our merge request now has also triggered a pipeline run, which is um, what we what we see here directly in the merge request, um, and which is why I always say, please create a merge request at the very beginning of your branch work, because now we have all the information which we need for a code review, for um, further collaboration on that. We have everything already available from the very beginning, from the first commit. So it's time to look at um, uh, So Alexei is asking, it's not obvious um, benefit have compared to simply Azure DevOps app settings, which are commonly used to store feature flag. Well, um, I would say um, that is just the GitLab way of implementing it. Um, and then again, if you decide to use a platform like GitLab, I always say the, um, the, the power of the platform comes from that we aggregate all the information you need in a single place. And you will see the power of that when we discuss the security scanners. Um, and then, of course, it kind of makes sense to also have the feature flag in the same platform. So um, let's just briefly have a look while we are waiting for, for the build to become ready. As you see here in the, um, in the branch, we are, of course, not deploying into production. We are deploying into a review environment. So there's a CI job defined. I will show you that in a moment which um, deploys it into my Kubernetes cluster, but in a dedicated, um, in a dedicated namespace, uh, so it doesn't interfere with my production deployment. Um, yeah, so now let's take the time to quickly look how these definitions are 
created in GitLab. We have a pipeline editor built in. We also can see that here in the in, in the source code. So that's a .gitlab CI YAML file, which defines um, how your pipelines um, will be created. I will use the pipeline editor here just because it also has all the syntax highlighting um, we might need. Um, in the CI file, we define the stages, um, which so far um, you've just basically seen. Um, let me just bring that up again. Um, the stages, um, build, test, deploy, cleanup. The cleanup stage we didn't see um, in a main branch because we deploy into production, so it doesn't make sense to have a cleanup stage. Here, where we create a temporary environment um, for the review applications so that we are able to ask our product managers to review it, that we can run dynamic application security testing against the running application. Um, we just create this temporary environment. And then, of course, at the end, we also want to tear it down again, because otherwise we would end with thousands of temporary deployments. So these are the stages. Um, and then we define basically the jobs in it. Um, that's um, YAML syntax. Um, if you're using Azure DevOps, um, you should be familiar with that. We define what stage a job is in. We define which container image we use uh, to run the job. There are different ways of running a job in GitLab. You have what we call a GitLab CI runner, which is responsible for executing the job. That runner on GitLab.com, we provide a fleet of runners for you, um, but you can also bring your own runners, maybe in a special environment, maybe in uh, on a special powerful machine, maybe on an embedded device, maybe on a MacBook. Um, you have multiple possibilities to set up such a runner. Runners can also have different execution environments. So you can have a runner, which is kind of the default, which launches a Docker container with the image that is specified here and then executes that script inside that container, but you can also have a runner which just executes something on shell level directly on a, a virtual machine, on a Windows PowerShell, and so on. So there are multiple possibilities how you can execute a job and in which environment you can execute it. Here, in this case, I'm using a gitlab.com runner on the runner fleet. I pick the one here, which I want to use for the build by specifying a tag. So you can tag jobs and you can tag your runners. And then the runners, um, the jobs will be executed on the runners which have the corresponding tag. So that's how you can make sure that your jobs are executed on the proper infrastructure. And of course, um, we have uh, the script and some additional data. I don't want to go too deep into that. We have the script that's defining a couple of environment variables and then basically does the Docker build and uh, the Docker build X and the Docker push. And then if we are on the default branch of our repository, we also tag the build as the latest build because that, that kind of makes sense. And then we store some variables for subsequent jobs. And also that's a quite important, you can very narrowly specify under which conditions such a job will be executed. So here, this job will be executed if you commit to a branch. It won't be executed, for example, if you commit to a tag, but it will be executed if you commit to a branch, and if there is a Docker file in my repository. So that's kind of how I make sure that this wouldn't run if there is no Docker file. We have other jobs, and I don't want to go into all of the details. My deploy to production job uses um, a ready-made image um, provided by GitLab, uh, which is called auto-deploy, to deploy it into a Kubernetes cluster. There are various ways by which you can do your deployments. It is completely up to you. The auto-deploy I use here is targeting directly to a Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, you can pick just different strategies. You can, of course, also do GitOp, GitOps um, deployments using integrations like Flux or Argo CD, um, which we can't cover really today for time reasons. And here you see this is where this deployment job, which pushes it into production, the image actually registers um, that this job is deploying into a production environment. So it says this is an environment which is called production, which all of these steps basically create. It could be additional things you need to create there, like invoking infrastructure as code to set up um, maybe a cloud database, whatever that is. Um, in the end, we just say this is the production environment and uh, this is the URL where we will be able to reach it. And it's basically what I showed you before. You have this open button in the environment view and you're just able to open the URL created from this build time variables here. So um, we have more jobs here than the build and the deploy. We have this bunch of um, test jobs, um, which do container scanning. So these are all the security uh, scanners. We'll cover that in detail in a moment, what they do. Um, but they basically come in by just including a template which GitLab provides. So for all these additional services um, like the security scanners, but also in theory for a Docker build, um, you are able just to rely on a template which GitLab provides. You can also define your own template library if you want. Um, I just basically created a build job myself here just to show you how powerful it is and also to show you that it's probably kind of related to um, the way Azure DevOps does it as well. You will have an image, you will have a script. Um, so that's um, a quite similar approach, I shall say. And then, yeah, we have this additional um, templates um, being included here. Some of those templates might require additional configuration, which is then usually done by defining variables, which can you, which you can define here as part of the CI, but you're also able to define them in the project settings um, or also in the groups above. So here I defined basically my Kubernetes namespace where I want to deploy this application. Um, and then all the other information about my Kubernetes cluster basically come from a group level definition, which I did. Um, so that is um, kind of inherited from um, the full lifecycle group where these things are defined. So I don't have to repeat the definition all over because all projects in my full lifecycle group go into my Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so now that we have seen how a CI pipeline is defined, um, there is actually a second deploy job um, down here, which is this review deployment that looks a lot slightly different from the production deployment job. And in particular, it defines this stop review environment job, which will be executed when I want to tear down uh, the, the review environment, which basically would just destroy the, the pot um, which my application here is running in. So that's basically just to uh, an auto deploy delete and removes the environment. Any questions so far to the structure and uh, the build up of a GitLab CI file? Feel free to raise your voice or raise your letters in, in the chat and um, we might come back to that later. So here in my merge request, um, the pipeline has uh, succeeded up to the point where I have to tear down the environment. Now, since I did this review environment, I can also just click here and see the application being deployed. Um, so that is kind of my branch deployment. 
and you see it says hello.net. And uh, since we created a feature flag in the branch, we should now be able to go to uh, the feature flags and actually enable it. And if I didn't mess up, if I go back here, we might have to wait these 10 seconds. If I reload, it will change from hello.net to hello customer. Here we go. It worked and I'll just turn off the feature flag again. And if we again wait a little bit, it will go back to hello.net. So the feature flag in this case uh, worked. I um, may of course now be able to go into, um, into a code review here, um, which is uh, what I would do. One nice thing, um, in GitLab is that we have AI, which provides you with a summary already of the um, of the changes that have been done. So um, there's a large language model. Basically, um, if you enable this experiment, it will take um, the commit messages and the change set. I will just write a short summary of what has been changed. So we edit the Unleash library, create the Unleash client, and set the appropriate settings. And then, yeah, we use the feature flag check to check before displaying the appropriate message. That's actually a pretty good summary. I would leave a feedback here. Um, OK, I would have to do it in an issue, so I won't do it. <laughs> Um, so that's a pretty good summary of um, what has been changed. Of course, we might go through a code review. I would assign myself as a reviewer here, which, well, you shouldn't do. Um, and I would go through the changes and check. Uh, I think we discussed that. Let me just quickly... Um, go over these two lines and add my comment here. This should go into configuration or environment variables. Let's start a review. So now I can collect all my remarks here on, on the diff. Um, maybe let's uh, add something here. Can we make this more verbose? Verbose. So I add this comment to the review and you see it collects the pending comments here. So I can review where I made suggestions. I can also directly make suggestions uh, for a change that here in the comments. But then at some point, I might just want to finish my review and then again, we have AI being able to help you here, just um, summarizing what I did. I have reviewed the merge request and to comment, verbosity of the code and the recommendation that the configuration should be used. It's a small amount of work, yes. So let's submit this review for the time being. And that will, of course, end up here in our merge request as uh, comment threads and um, give all the context which we need on the change set. And um, now I can, of course, work with my fellow developers on that until I say, OK, we are satisfied. This is we resolve the threat. We can directly loop through the unresolved comments in the merge request here. We can, of course, configure our merge request that now it's, of course, it's blocked because it's a draft. But if I remove the draft mark, it's marked as ready to merge. We can configure our project that it's not ready to merge unless all of the threads are resolved. We can also configure it that we are not allowed to merge if the pipeline um, is, uh, didn't succeed. So there are various configuration options um, how to do that. We can define approvers, again, optional or mandatory. So we want to maybe 
um, get the approval of um, a senior developer if we changed specific files. That's the code owner feature. So you can define in your repository who is responsible for certain files or directories. And then you can define in the project that if those are changed in a merge request, the approval of the code owner is mandatory. We don't have that here, but um, it's possible. So in theory, we could proceed and uh, deploy the application er, and merge the application back into the main branch and go on from here. Okay. Um, with that being said, that kind of covers um, the source code management workflow. We sh should now have a brief look at um, what the security scanners do, which, well, as you might recall, are part of our um, um, part of our test stage here. They can run in other stages, of course, if you want, but these are um, done in the test stages here. Um, GitLab offers a huge amount of um, security scanners. The kind of the obvious ones are things like container scanning, where we scan the Docker image, which we just built um, for outdated software in the image. Um, we have the dependency scan, so it will pick up the package log file I created and then look for vulnerabilities um, that are known to the dependency of my project. We have a secret detection, which would prevent that you accidentally check in um, a, a key or a hardwired password somewhere, be able to notify you about that. We have the static code analysis here, which looks at your code and then tries to find any programming flaws, which um, might be exploitable to some extent. We can review the findings of those scanners um, here in our tabs. So if you, of course, if I would have additional unit tests, um, I would be able to review um, those tests and the test results here. Um, I can review the security findings. So the container scanner kind of surfaced a lot because the .NET image um, I used comes with tons of dependencies. That's a Microsoft default image. I don't know why it does have so many uh, default dependencies like uh, the X2FS prox within a container. For me, it wouldn't make any sense, but for whatever reason, Microsoft um, obviously opted for putting all of these in. There are some CVEs um, reported for those, which is kind of the reason why the scanner surfaced them here. The license scanning also checked the dependencies, so we are not accidentally pulling in um, a GNU public license um, uh, or a Faro GNU public license um, a licensed dependency, which would then force us basically to release our source code as well under the same license. So here we are safe because it's Apache and MT license. That's good. And apart from the review possibility here in the pipeline, because it also runs on the main branch of our project, we get also the ability to view that on a higher level. This is available then on a project level, but also on a group level um, where you are able to dive a little bit deeper into the findings of the scanners. Um, here you would now be able to say, okay, all the findings uh, from the container scanner, I would just filter to that one. Um, I will probably able to dismiss those because um, these are not applicable default ms.net image. So I would assume that Microsoft does their due diligence and we will be left with this one critical vulnerability, which might be worth investigating because it's part of the um, database library. Now, our application doesn't use any database for now, but um, this might be something we want to look into. We can do so by going into the details. So we see, okay, this is an SQLite vulnerabilities, um, which 
may or may not be relevant for us. Um, but we get all the required information which we need to do a proper triage on that one. Um, we, of course, would then be able also to directly create a JIRA issue from here, from these security findings, and just dismiss this one also as not applicable because, yeah, I don't think this is a real issue for us right now. Since we did the dependency scan, we also have a look to all the dependencies that includes dependencies from the container image, which we are using, um, but also dependencies from the .NET environment. So we get kind of the full um, software bill of material of our final build artifact of our final container. Let me just go quickly through that. So these are all the dependencies from um, from the build. Um, there might be some dependencies from our, ah, no, we don't have dependencies in the main branch. We only have dependencies to unleash in the feature branch. So these are not shown here. That's the reason. So we only have the dependencies of the last successful scan of our production branch. That's important to know. Um, the feature branch right now is uh, is not is not covered by this, where we have the dependencies to unleash and the JSON library. And of course, we also can have a look at the license compliance. I will jump to a different project um, for showing you a little bit better um, what uh, the security um, scanners would find in those um situations that's my standard demo project for these kind of um, topics um where you see a little bit more on the vulnerability side let's jump into the report let's maybe pick a SAS vulnerability um which you might see here so this is um sql injection possibility in some of my python files here can briefly have a look at this um and you can immediately see that's a classic way how to not build an SQL query. Um, so you might run into that issue here that the ID is an injectable parameter from the outside, which could cause an SQL injection. So this is what the, what the scanner, of course, um, caught immediately. There is additional information available apart from where we have found it, what kind of vulnerability that is. We link to training websites, secure to code warrior in this case, where you can get um, additional information um, about um, this type of flaw, which um, you are then able to exploit yourself here on um, on, on Secure Code Warrior and do basically, yeah, understand um, what this kind of issue is about. We also link to an AI here. Again, the same thing. We ask a last language model, large language model um, with your code if you desire to do so um, about this vulnerability and how to remedy it. So it will give you like, this is the vulnerable code here. This is an attack example, why um, you shouldn't do that. And it gives you a possibility how to resolve that. Although I would not really say this is the best way to do it. So I would mark this as unhelpful, not the best solution for a security fix of an SQL injection. You should do this with name parameters. I will give the feedback to our AI team. This is a beta feature. So they are depending on our feedback. And then of course, um, since this is um, what has been detected in the main branch, and I also have a feature, um, a feature branch here with a merge request that adds some additional vulnerabilities um, which I couldn't do in .NET because of my lack of .NET knowledge. That's the reason why I need to show it here in the Python project. Um, in this Python feature branch, we add some vulnerabilities uh, like hard coding a password, 
adding a very permissive ch mod here so some stuff that you shouldn't do and then of course the security scanners caught this they give me the diff between what's in the main branch and what's in my feature branch so i see the hard coded password the permissive file mask some results of the um of dependencies i added which are vulnerable so the dependency scanner caught those um, so I can see kind of the delta between um, the main branch and my feature branch to understand what I have introduced in this branch, which would be an issue if it would go into production. Also, I introduced a new public license um, dependency here, which I should not. So I did. there's a policy on this project which basically prevents me from doing that. So the merge request will be blocked if there are any um, licenses which are outside of the scope um, and if there are any critical or high vulnerabilities, this merge request is blocked in, um, in this moment and it cannot go on. Um, so that is then something probably the security team would define on all of the projects um, under which circumstances you as a developer are able to just continue your work or under which circumstances the merge request is blocked and you might seek approval from the security team, which is possible. So you, it's possible to define that um, specific people. In this case, it's me and my colleague, Stephanie. We are the people who are defined in the policy as potential approvers. So we might be the company CISO or the security team. So we can still say, okay, we accept this risk. We have looked through that legally. Um, and also from the security scannings, we accept this risk. We approve this merge request anyway. Okay. So we are approaching um, the end of the hour. Um, Let's uh, quickly have a look through the agenda. I think I covered um, like the topics I wanted to cover. The JIRA integration, we went through like a regular workflow with um, creating a branch, creating a merge request, doing the code review. We had a look how the automation works. We had a look how the security scanners are integrated and our tight integration part of GitLab and of the workflow, so how the policies we defined prevent merge requests which carry potentially malicious vulnerabilities going into production. And of course, we covered um, your, um, your topic of the feature flags. And yeah, as I, as I already uh, thought, the migration from Azure DevOps is kind of uh, something we need to discuss separately, but I think um, you got a good impression of how GitLab does uh, CI CD so that a migration from Azure DevOps might not be too difficult to achieve. And um, Alexei, to cover your questions, I hope you also have seen that the power of that single platform where everything comes together like the full software development lifecycle in a single platform, which is then, of course, also cloud agnostic. It's not limited to deploy into Azure. You can deploy in AWS. You can deploy everywhere. So yeah, not that tightly bound to a specific cloud platform, which at some point might become handy. The idea of multi-cloud is around since a while, and um, some companies use that. Um, so that, of course, becomes increasingly easier with GitLab as a cloud agnostic platform. Then also, GitLab is open source. We are an open source product, um, which also means we undergo a lot of scrutiny by um, external security researchers. Also means the overall security of the whole platform is um, probably very, very good compared to closed source platforms, as usually the case with open source software, um, because 
more people invest time into it to find security flaws and report them in, uh, um, in a responsible way. And then also one thing that might become important at some point, GitLab is available as a platform on gitlab.com where I showed you the demo of today, but you can also self-host an instance of GitLab. So you have kind of a full control over the data residency if that is required, especially of course for um, regulated businesses, this might become an issue at some point. So I would say GitLab is the more flexible solution all over the place. And with that, I think we conclude uh, today's uh, lunch and learn session. I hope that was helpful to you and you got a good overview. Um, Sophia, do you have some, some closing words? Um, I mean, I think it was, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think um, it was, you know, we covered a, a wide range of things today. So um, we can send you the recording, Paul. Um, you can share it with anybody else who might have missed today's session. I see we don't have any other question in the chat. Um, so what I'm thinking as a next step is to, you know, for your team to discuss internally. And then if you have any other questions, we can set up, set up another session to go over those or, um, you know, dive deeper into particular areas that might be of interest. Um, but if you do have any initial thoughts or comments from your side, we'd be um, eager to hear them. Yep, I mean, I thought it looked really good. So obviously it's been several years since I've used GitLab and I think Patrick as well. So cool to see some of the improvements that we've missed out on. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll gather feedback internally uh, and then we'll yeah take it from there, like you said. Okay, sounds great. Um, all right, thank you so much for your time, everybody. Um, I hope this was helpful. Jan, thank you for walking us through all that. We'll send you the recording and I'll be in touch for a feedback session. That's great. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Right. Have a good Bye. day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.